my name is Stefan Barda and I'm a lymphoma doctor at the University of Pennsylvania where I lead the T-cell lymphoma program. And I'd like to talk today about a study that we did with 19 other US institutions to find out about the risk of CNS relapse in patients with T-cell lymphomas. T-cell lymphomas are a group of very heterogeneous subtypes they make up now about 26 subtypes by the latest WHO classifications, and there are probably going to be more as we learn more about the molecular characteristics of these different disease entities. The other thing about T cell lymphomas is that they are rare. Only 10 to 15 percent of all non Hodgkin lymphomas diagnosed in the US and Europe are T cell lymphomas, where the rest are B cell lymphomas. This is slightly more common in other parts of the world. For example, T cell lymphomas are more common in Asia and particularly East Asia. Furthermore, there's a geographic variation in the incidence of T cell lymphomas. For example, EBV related T cell lymphomas or HTLV1 virus related T cell lymphomas are again more common in certain parts of the world, such as East Asia or the um, Caribbean Basin or parts of Africa and South America. So all in all, we're dealing with a very heterogeneous group of oftentimes aggressive diseases for which, unfortunately, the unifying characteristics um, are that the treatment outcomes are less optimal than we'd like them to be. Uh, we already know that certain T cell lymphomas are associated with an increased risk of CN risk relapse that's been well described for diseases like uh, adult T cell leukemia lymphoma, particularly um, where we have a significant risk of uh, CNS relapse. And part of addressing that is part of our in initial treatment where we give CNS directed therapy to reduce that risk of CNS involvement. The central nervous system is usually a sanctuary site. So most of the chemotherapy or other therapies that we are giving for patients to treat their lymphoma does not go there or penetrate the CNS, and, and therefore cancer cells can be hiding out there. Because T cell lymphomas are so rare, the event of CNS relapse hasn't been really described very well in many patients. The largest case series were only up to 30 patients, um, and uh, there was a big knowledge gap which we tried to fill with this study. So what we did is ask, we asked 19 North American institutions um, and uh, with their help, we collected patients who had experienced CNS relapse after they had been treated initially for the T cell lymphomas and collected these cases and tried to describe them to find unifying characteristics. And we found that, for example, having two extranodal sites of involvement at diagnosis was associated with a high risk of CNS relapse later. Uh, other risk factors that were described were an increased LDH, um, the presence of B symptoms. And we also found that certain subtypes of T cell lymphoma had a higher risk of CNS relapse, such as peripheral T cell lymphoma, not otherwise specified, and intestinal T cell lymphomas. Um, we next um, created a risk model to assess the strength of each association with a CNS uh, relapse and, and, and thereby created a prognostic model that helped us predict what the risk of CNS relapse will be at the time of diagnosis for any given patients with the majority of T cell lymphoma subtypes. Um, and this model we, we termed um, city um, a city model, and that is actually a prognostic tool that is accessible uh, on the website when you look up the publication, and that can be accessed by anybody who would like to calculate the risk for, for their patients. And in order to make sure that this is a valid predictive model, we then validated this model in an independent cohort of patients from the Swedish Lymphoma Registry of over 500 patients. Um, and we're able to validate that we were able to identify three uh, distinct separate risk groups. There is a high risk group of patients um, who had a risk of CNS relapse of about 13% um, if specific factors 
were present based on our model. There is a low risk group of patients where the risk is only 2.2%. And then there's an intermediate risk group of patients with 7.4%. Um, we also found out that the CNS relapse usually occurs within one year of the diagnosis. And unfortunately that our treatments for CNS relapse are inadequate. Um, we, we saw responses in some patients. Um, the response rates were around 30 to 40% in patients. And there are some patients who benefited and were able um, to remain in remission from the CNS relapse. Um, but unfortunately, the majority of patients um, succumbed later to their disease. That's another thing we learned that although um, many of these patients initially often isolated CNS relapse, several patients had at the same time systemic relapse or relapsed systemically later. And the majority of um, the reason why patient died in our cohort was actually from systemic lymphoma rather than the CNS lymphoma. So it means that the CNS relapse is probably just a harbinger or another sign for a particularly aggressive lymphoma that um, these patients have. Um, so in, in general, what have we learned? We have learned that there are clearly identifiable risk factors uh, for CNS relapse. We have learned that if patients have low risk disease, the risk of CNS relapse is, is only about 2%, whereas if they have high risk disease, it's, um, it's around 13%. Unfortunately, what we do not know is how to prevent the CNS relapse, and that's certainly an area of need to identify how can we reduce this risk for all of our patients, and particularly the high-risk patients. We have not been truly able to identify any treatment factors in our group of patients that would have let us know that if you do this, for example, use a certain drug such as a toposide that we think can penetrate the CNS barrier or perform an autologous stem cell transplant that, that clearly is associated with a lower risk of CNS relapse later.